And today, as mentioned yesterday, we are going to talk about volunteering management, some logistics, and we will have some case study. So yeah, that's our program for today. And uh, at the beginning, I think Amelie and Elishka prepared for you uh, some uh, interesting information. So here to you guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. I hope you are fresh and uh, you are ready for uh, for this uh, today's workshop. Uh, I will start, and me uh, and then Amelie will sometimes like jump in, and then I will jump into uh, her workshop. So we will be complementing each other. And uh, at the beginning, I would like to ask, uh, are there guys who are preparing workshop for the logistics, which will be like after our workshop for the management? Are you here, guys? Um, I see the trunk is already here. So maybe I just chat her. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, like uh, how much time. Hi. I... Hello. Yes, hello, I'm here. Hello, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you for how long, uh, like how much time will your workshop take today? So I know like how to manage with time for, for mine and Amelie's workshop. Um, because uh, maybe I misunderstood a little bit because yesterday I, I asked, mm, for Vietnam, for our part is we need a case study, right? So we can share yes. about yes, the exactly. Lot. That's what is Elishka asking about. So how much is your case study actually taking part? Just half hour or forty five minutes? Maximum half hour. So that is and for Q and A also. Great, thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. so we have some little bit extra time, right? That's uh, that's good. So. Uh, I would like to start with something uh, light today. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about like who is uh, or who could be the ideal volunteer. Yeah, like uh, our organizations uh, probably or you were a volunteer or you hosted a volunteer or you were sending volunteer abroad. So first, uh, let's talk like who is actually the ideal volunteer. And uh, I would like to ask you not only for the positive characteristics like motivated and energetic, but I would like to also hear uh, if you have some ideas what kind of, let's say, negative or less positive uh, char characteristics of the volunteer you wouldn't mind. Because we know that uh, nobody's perfect, of course. So I would like to also that uh, together we would brainstorm also what uh, kind of like uh, also less positive characteristics you would uh, allow your volunteer to have. So feel free to uh, use the sticker. Uh, we can use the green sticker for the like more positive uh, uh, characteristics and then uh, pink uh, stickers for the, let's say like less positive. So you can take like, uh, one, two minutes for yourself and uh, to think about it. Uh, Elishka, can you just briefly post the link uh, into the chat? Uh huh, yeah, yeah. Ah, sorry, I didn't do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's more, it's morning. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, but uh, where's the chat here? Here, okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, here is the. Okay, I hope, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Wait, I hope you can. I will try one more link. Yeah, because yeah, I think for sharing. This... Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, now, 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 now. You can. The last one is with sharing. No, not really. It should be. No, oh, it's still asking for a request. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Let's try now, please. Yeah, it works. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So you can take like one, two minutes 
uh, to think and uh, when you have some idea, you can start already posting. I think it's such a tricky question because you actually have like, you know, when you come to an interview and they ask you about your negative uh, characteristics and you're like, oh my God, what are you going to tell? Yeah, I work, I work too much. hard. I work too hard. I'm, work I'm too hard. committed. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's I'm like too motivated. Or the other is another one like too detail oriented or I don't know. <laughs> Let's not think about it like what you want to uh, read in the CV, but like um, like to think like in reality, like how the volunteer can be. He can be, uh, I don't know, lazy or he can be, uh, I don't know. He doesn't have to uh, speak English at all. He can have, uh, I don't know, some, let's say some positive characteristics. So he can have like a lot of experience or he can have like no experience or he can, uh, uh, he doesn't have to be uh, communicative at all because maybe he prefers only to work like on computer, not to talk with anyone else. Okay, we're starting with the negative ones. Yes, work in a team. Mm -hmm. Working alone. Positive, optimistic. Open to adapt to uh, changes that uh, might happen, especially now during the COVID crazy times. Taking initiative and be proactive. Mm -hmm. Eager to learn new things. Mm -hmm. Not in uh, employment, uh, education, or, or training, uh, meaning like with like no experience. Be punctual, but also flexible. Very young and no previous experience at all. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about the taking initiative and being proactive uh, because I think that there are some positions that you really don't need to be proactive. <laughs> as <laughs> as I would say that sometimes you have such a kind of job that somebody tells you, oh, this is what I need, and then you're like, yeah. Doing sometimes it being proactive that. is a problem <laughs> for, exactly. The, exactly. for the company. <laughs> <laughs> Happens sometimes. That's true. A volunteer with a heart. Oh, that's nice. Enthusiastic. I hope we all do have heart. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So I think like no new posts are are coming. So okay, perfect. So, um, where do we start? Let's start with the, with the less positive ones and then we can go to the positive ones. So, uh, working alone, who, who made this post, working alone? What did you mean by working alone? Well, as an opposite to working in a group, in a team, I think mm -hmm. that they're really like, as I mentioned, with taking initiative and being proactive, I think that also working alone must not be exactly a problem if you mm -hmm. have like really analytical kind of job for example or mm -hmm. just really coding or any kind of bad stuff it should not be a problem working alone so yeah it's kind of opposite to teamwork because mm -hmm. some people are not you know they're just exchanging some information but they're not really team people 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what about the English level? I think we already had some discussions yesterday. Uh, what is your opinion like what the ideal like, uh, let's say, English level should be of the volunteer? Is there someone who thinks that uh, English is uh, not required for your position in your organization, for example, or like uh, very low English is uh, sufficient? Again, I think depending on the country, uh, but there may be other languages that uh, the person actually might know and can be useful, especially mm -hmm. if you are moving around Europe and you have a second language that you're better at than English. And for the basic communication, if you're doing some kind of manual work or, you know, helping, I don't know, in the school, watching over the children, mm -hmm. I think B1 is okay because you can perfectly communicate uh, easy things, but yeah, I, I personally didn't have experience. Definitely would be better have B2 level so you are really comfortable around people. But I see mm -hmm. that you want to say something. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I, I think it depends also on the country. Yes, excuse me. Uh, you stopped uh, talking. Yeah, I, I, I. I think, yeah, because I see only four faces, so I don't know who is, who is actually speaking. I think it's all also depending on the country and on the hosting placement. For example, we coordinate different hosting here in Italy where the, the staff itself doesn't have uh, a very good level of English. So it's really um, to take into account where the volunteer is actually going, where the volunteer is actually applying because for some places it's really necessary that they are, for example, interested at least in learning the, the basics of, in our case, Italian or the local, the local language. So this is also important, no? To not only the level of English, but also the motivation, for example, to learn the, the language of the host country. So I think it's really personal depending on where the volunteer, in which project the volunteer wants to go. Mm -hmm. Is uh, the factor that uh, in our project we are sending uh, or receiving volunteers for uh, only three months, is it some like factor that we have to consider or what is your opinion on this, guys? When you're talking about learning the local language, for example. Yeah, I think in this case for the three months, of course, the communication should be should be done in English. That's why maybe for this for this case we have to focus on maybe a, a, a good level from both the, the parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think that, uh, for example, I can speak like from our experience that uh, when we had volunteer for like short period, uh, it just takes a lot of time uh, if the volunteer didn't speak that very good English that um, she was kind of lost and when she was getting into it, uh, it was already over for her project. So maybe it's better uh, that to give the opportunity to someone uh, who doesn't speak that good English, for example, for a longer project because they have some time to get better into it and then actually to have some like time to fully like live in the project. But that's just, for example, like uh, our, our experience. Uh, Maybe can you give us some example from uh, Asian countries? Uh, did you have some volunteer with a uh, low level of English? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes uh, I have met uh, one Japanese volunteer who worked in a in a folklore museum, and he he could not speak Thai or English very well. Mm -hmm. He he did the project for six months, and after two to three months he got better in Thai. So I think local language could be okay. No need to, to speak like advanced or medium English. He can improve from time to time. I think that that's possible. And it's good for him to, to learn local language uh, than English because in, in a museum, a local museum, people tend to speak Thai to him. So that's why he get better in Thai. And I heard that he got, uh, Thai girlfriend after that. So maybe that's a kind of improvement for him to practice Thai also. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so language skills is something to, to consider. Uh, I see here uh, need or no experience. 
whose post it was. Can you give us some comment on it? Aha, uh -huh, Carolina. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, based on the fact that these kind of projects are, uh, of course, uh, directed to the development of the volunteer itself. So, of course, the fact that the volunteer is coming, being not in training, uh, in education and so on, is, of course, a plus because it's a possibility for him or her to develop skills and to, to, mm -hmm. to create a better enter in the job market in the future. So, of course, this doesn't have to be a thing that is frightening the association, but, you know, uh, the volunteer doesn't have to be the best on the CV, but has to be the person that needs the best the experience at the time. So, mm -hmm. this is... Yeah, thank you. Yeah, like the volunteer doesn't have to be the best because we are not uh, looking for uh, the best employees, but uh, we are looking also for someone to give them experience. So it's like a trade off. They give us their time and their hands and their enthusiasm, but uh, it's okay if uh, they are not the best of the best. Uh, yeah, if, if, I can, if I can add something, and because <laughs> I, was, I was writing something very similar to Caro without knowing. I was writing very young and no previous experience at all. Yeah. Um, in our experience, like having coordinated uh, more or less hundreds of volunteers, um, of course, very general, generally speaking, uh, if a volunteer is very young, most probably is as well more open-minded than an older one. So mm -hmm. as well, the fact that the, if the if the volunteer has no previous experience, especially no previous professional experience, there is less a risk that the volunteer get disappointed by what they do. So um, more or less uh, what we say is that sometimes it's better the volunteer comes with not too high expectations, not because the project is not good, but because if you give uh, space and room for improvement and for getting surprised, then you will enjoy the project more. Mm -hmm. If you come already with a, the idea that you will do a kind of internship, you will uh, improve your technical skills, there is a high risk that you get disappointed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also connected to the flexibility that we discussed yesterday, that we want our volunteers to be flexible uh, because mm -hmm. the activities can change and uh, not only because of COVID, but because of like, for example, like unexpected opportunities for the organization. So uh, yeah, thank you for, for this contribution. We have a new contribution there that uh, you wouldn't mind if the volunteer would be arrogant or wouldn't share ideas. <laughs> I know it was Andre who wrote it, right? No? No, oh, no, no, no. I'm just laughing that Ah, okay. That I thought it was interesting. I... No. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Uh, have you had some experience uh, that uh, the volunteer, for example, was arrogant? Or how did you solve the situation? Andre, who was laughing? I don't know who wrote this. Arrogant, it was not me. But yes, yes, uh, I, I was uh, just thinking what uh, Daniela was talking about, this younger volunteer versus um, uh, older volunteer and their expectation. And I had very similar experience that volunteers who were like 18 with, uh, you know, after just after high school, like uh, some of them, it was like fantastic to work with because they, they can do everything. They say yes to everything. And when I had volunteers who were like 28, and they had very good English, then this very good English means they can argue with you a lot. So it doesn't, so what was this good English skills for, for arguing with the coordinator? I mean, that, that was really, and yeah, I mean, it, it sometimes, yeah, so I, I agree with what Daniela was saying. We had a similar experience. So now at the moment, for example, I really prefer younger volunteers with, um, basic skills and basic experience and they they are this more flexible but it's it's a very as also uh, carolina was saying is also very uh, it can be different for different projects so what the need of the of the project and so sometimes of course if the older volunteer with a lot of experience will uh, like uh, uh, be very um, 
like motivated for the activities he can do amazing things but yes but yeah i i remember also some arrogant volunteers and it was difficult and with good english no difficult that's it from my side <laughs> Thank you from your experience from a real life, Andre. <laughs> uh, let's uh, check out briefly the positive characteristics uh, because we mentioned them also yesterday. So we can just uh, look at uh, them briefly. Uh, I like the, the post with uh, the characteristic resilient. Can you give us a comment on that? What do you mean by being resilient? Who is the author of this? Post. There's no author. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Hello, Jennifer. hello, Jennifer. From Philippines again. Uh, anyway, when, when we speak of being resilient at this time of COVID-19 pandemic, we have been experiencing a lot of challenges. And um, with the sudden shift and with the fast changing world, we need to be resilient at all times. We need to uh, have the capacity to recover quickly from any kind of difficulties. So that's why resiliency is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I can speak from experience from last year, Asia, that uh, when we sent volunteer, I think it was to Vietnam, that uh, it was very, even for experienced uh, volunteers, it was difficult to adapt to the new environment. So we were really thinking of if the person can like uh, also is doing like uh, cyclically well uh, to handle everything. And uh, now, as you say, with the COVID pandemic, uh, things can change uh, rapidly. So being resilient, uh, it's a good thing. But uh, how would you, Jennifer, recognize if the person is resilient from CV, for example? Is there a way how to recognize this? Hello? Yes. Uh, what's that again? Uh, how would you recognize from a CV or Skype interview if the person is resilient? Um, um, we can uh, actually uh, uh, ask questions regarding resiliency on how they deal with challenges and how they easily adapt to, uh, for example, COVID-19 pandemic, how they did during that time. Uh, do, they uh, do they have to stop um, doing um, volunteerism? Or how do they do that? So basically, you like asking questions based on their experience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, if, if, if I can add to that, I think, um, of course, it's, it's very hard to, to get uh, information about re resilience in a, mm -hmm. in a volunteer from a, from a CV and from a Skype call. But what we can do at least is to ask uh, which challenges they have faced personally in their life. So not uh, rather than how they theoretically think to approach them, but how they actually manage. So uh, I don't know what was the main challenge they had or um, to analyze a little bit uh, the pre previous experience, like studying experience or working experience and let them talk about what, what happened. So we can, uh, more or less we can understand if the person when they were facing some difficulties how they were uh, reacting to to that of course it's not 100 percent uh, sure but at least can give can give us a little bit more or less an, an idea on how the person is dealing with uh, with difficult situation or challenging situations mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much uh, now we were talking like how well, the ideal volunteer should uh, look like, but I would like to make a bridge now. And uh, because we are, uh, we will be hosting or sending volunteers under the uh, European Voluntary Service, which has, uh, let's say, like maybe a little bit like different standards or different uh, procedures than uh, some other uh, volunteering programs that you might know, or just like simple having uh, some local volunteers. So uh, I would like to ask you briefly, think again, uh, you can uh, switch uh, from the ideal volunteer board and the EVS ideal volunteer board, and you can copy paste uh, either the positive or, or the negative characteristics that you think that are applicable for the volunteer under the European Voluntary Service. 
based on your experience or your knowledge, what do you know about the program at this moment? So we already see that uh, the few opportunities as defined in the Erasmus Plus guide. So thank you very much. Amelie will talk about it uh, later on. What does it actually mean to have uh, fewer opportunities uh, and why, uh, uh, why is it even mentioned in, uh, in the Erasmus Plus uh, program? Again, no uh, experience, not in education or some training. Uh, I agree with you guys. That's what we talked about. What kind of positive characteristics the volunteer should have, even though coming from the European Voluntary Service Program? I'm sorry, I have a technical question. I don't know how to uh, copy and paste from one page to an, another one in, uh, in Jamboard. Uh, you can just uh, control C and control uh, V. Oh, okay, like, it works. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so sorry. Yeah, yeah. Just me. like uh, copy pasting okay. text yeah. when doing your essay at uh, high school, just like <laughs> Control C, Control V. <laughs> Elish, what, are, what are you talking about? <laughs> you give some practices from your studies? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, about high school essay. <laughs> Now we don't do it from Wikipedia, so it's it's a different. <laughs> you know, when I was in high school, we didn't have computer, you know, and I, and I would close it here. <laughs> so you were copying books on copy machine, okay? <laughs> like <laughs> handwriting. <laughs> Daniel, I didn't know you are so old. You were handwriting your your thesis, but you I use know, this. You I use... know that because I look very young and handsome. That's why. Yes, but you use this ancient thing from the like feather, <laughs> feather with a trumpet. Motivation as the only selection criteria uh, in theory. Uh, can someone give uh, us comment? What do you mean uh, in theory? To elaborate on it. Sorry that I'm so active. I'm proactive. You see, this is the example of two active volunteer and then others cannot speak. Because I, I wrote this uh, that, uh -huh. um, before we spoke about some language skills that in some places it would be really useful if the volunteer, for example, has some good English level. But um, at the same time, you know, we should give opportunity to people with maybe, uh, you know, uh, who don't speak maybe so good English, you know, and like, and then um, it's the, it's complicating to choose, to give good opportunity to somebody or to respect the hosting place needs. So I think this is uh, eternal struggle <laughs> between a host, a hosting place expectation and, and, you know, giving chance to some Less uh, so some disadvantaged volunteer. I really, I, I really admire, for example, some French organizations who have also the service civic program, who give so much, you know, work for the volunteers with less opportunities. They really find good places for them. Like it's it's amazing to see. And sometimes I I'm so uh, disappointed, like also here in Slovakia, when I see some volunteer with law degree and a good family background, perfect English, or you meet volunteers in Slovakia and they everybody speak perfect English. Like what kind of people with fewer opportunities these are? I don't know. These are just my philosophical question. It's hard to make ideal program all the time, but we should try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you again for your comment from real life. <laughs> uh... Responsible and respectful to local cultures. 
how can you recognize if the person uh, will respect uh, you, your your cultures? Why is it important uh, for you if you will host a volunteer? So uh, often before, so this one we will uh, talk about the in the logistic later. But for volunteer, of course, we will send them the um, uh, some like uh, some taboo or some like uh, some special customs of uh, local uh, culture. So the volunteer should like uh, should not do it and should do it. And if they know it, they should uh, respect our our our, our uh, culture. And such as like this in my country. The people often ask uh, their age, or uh, sometimes like, uh, "Have you got married?" or something like this. And if they if they don't know, of course we will mention it in the guidelines and uh, something. And if they know it, they should be like, "Okay, this is open minded and uh, be welcome with that kind of question. Just smile." But not like uh, like uh, be angry with the, the 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 questioner or something like that, or sometimes like uh, they put off um, the shoe in front uh, in before uh, like uh, entering the house or something like that, and uh, or keep uh, quiet after eleven or ten p.m. or the neighboring neighbors uh, who uh, yes sometimes we have a lot of things for, for respect um, the local culture mm -hmm. and. Uh, I can share something like this to differences between the uh, Asian and European uh, cultures, such as in uh, your country, you can um, uh, wear the bikini or wear very short in the, in the public or somewhere. But in our culture, somewhere, you are uh, rarely to see someone wear very, very short or like a bikini, even the women. Uh, not not the respect, but it, it, such as in the if they go to the pagoda, yes, or the church, they should respect the culture by like uh, wear the long skirt or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, I understand. Oh. But is it something uh, that the volunteer has to know uh, in the beginning, or is it something that uh, we can work with him before coming to the country, for example? I think this one we should uh, like uh, working with them before coming to the country. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah. uh, it's okay if uh, when the volunteer will apply for the volunteering position, he doesn't know much about your culture before or... Uh, doesn't matter. It, it's okay. So it, at the beginning, it, it's fine. This is something yeah, you can work the, with him just, later on, right? Yes, just before departure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, like... Uh -huh. uh, I think that uh, sometimes like uh, we have to be ready that uh, some expectations that we want the volunteer to be, for example, open minded to respect our culture or uh, respect, for example, like gender. It's something that we can also work with the person before and, and during the project. Uh, so it's uh, OK if uh, the volunteer is not a ready product at the beginning. Uh, that's why we also have this uh, training, for example, to to get some guidelines for the preparation and for the mentoring later on of the volunteer. So I think it's okay that uh, at the beginning, uh, the volunteer is not like ready-made product, but uh, it's just important to know how to work with him or her before and, and during, and of course, like after the project. So thank you very much for this comment. Uh, yes, uh, to conclude this and to give floor to Amelie, who will like elaborate on this topic more. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I liked uh, how we brainstormed all the characteristics of the volunteer. Uh, I'm happy that uh, I heard some uh, really nice contribution from uh, real life. Excuse because... me, Alishka. Yes. Uh, can I add something about the people with disabilities? Of course, Anita. Uh, I'm Anita Gagoska from Maladinfo, but I worked uh, for 15 years with people with disabilities. And uh, it's very important for the people with disabilities uh, to be um, positive and understand uh, that uh, in some cultures uh, they can be uh, treated differently uh, as uh, in their own country. So they can be maybe discriminated or, or seen di uh, differently. So they have to be prepared about that. Mm -hmm. To not be grumpy and to not re react um, 
strange on those uh, uh, reactions from the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think this is useful point for the, for example, preparation of the volunteer uh, yes. when there will be like interviews with the hosting and center organization. So this is yes. one of the topic that uh, could be covered. Thank yes. you very much. They have to be aware that there is differences in the cultures uh, about the people with uh, disabilities. So they probably will be treated differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, just to uh, conclude, uh, that uh, sometimes the expectations of the volunteer, uh, we have to also work with the reality that uh, we talked about it also yesterday, that uh, we have to think of the motivation of the volunteer, like why they want to uh, come and volunteer in our organization and to be ready that uh, it's fine if they have some like, let's say less positive characteristics, because as was said here, we're, we're not choosing uh, the best one. We're just trying to give some opportunity to other people. And uh, now I can give floor to Amelie uh, that uh, she will talk about the philosophy of the EVS volunteer. And also she will uh, elaborate more on the fear opportunities. Uh, what does it mean and uh, how is it defined in the Erasmus uh, program? Thank you, Eliska. So uh, I will share my screen now. So just to, to say that uh, the objective is really uh, to go back to the principles of EVS or ESC, uh, but we, we won't be going into much details and, and really it's really open to discussions to add your experiences and how you, you, you see uh, the philosophy of EVS and what is your point of view. We will present what is defined in the, in the guide and, and by the European Commission and national agencies, but uh, yeah. So, uh, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So uh, about the philosophy of whether it be EVS or ESC, uh, so European Solidarity Corp, uh, the objective is to provide young people, including young people with fewer opportunities, which we will define later on, uh, with easily accessible opportunities for engagement in solidarity activities that induce positive societal changes in the Euro European Union, but also beyond, while improving and properly validating their competencies, as well as facilitating their continuous engagement as active citizens. So this is the official, let's say, definition that we can uh, see. Uh, do you all agree with this definition? Would you do you think we should add some things to it? Uh, on with your experience with volunteers and whether you have taken also part into volunteering activities before, do you feel like this definition summarizes everything? Just to give you feedback, and then we are all like kind of waving uh, the head and. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Because I'm not seeing a lot of people now. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the idea now is just to, to remind everybody of who can take part in EVS uh, volunteering activities and the different implementing bodies, just to see where we are working from now <laughs> with this project and uh, how we will proceed also uh, more technically. Uh, after if we if we collaborate on other volunteering activities. Uh, so who can take part in EVS ESC volunteering projects? So of course young people. So just a few elements, important elements. So they would be between 18 and 30 years old. So uh, in general, these are activities of from two months up to 12 months. Uh, maybe we can uh, present Michaela or Andre uh, how it's working with our projects uh, because we have two different uh, duration and it's not uh, an EVS or ESC uh, convention, but it's uh, through the capacity building. So if you want to, to add something about this. Uh, maybe Andre, you can add something. I have really nothing. Uh, to add. Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, I mean, 
Uh, it's it's written in this uh, volunteering agreement because every organization yeah. has a little bit different and also there were some changes on the way that uh, yeah. as you as we know that now the old program is ending and some organization probably will not uh, have the new uh, accreditation for the new year or we we still don't know but you know the basic what was written in the project application is written in your uh, agreements about the sending hosting so as, as written there with possibilities to adapt as you know this training was supposed to happen in vietnam i guess so we need to be flexible also with volunteer yeah. hosting sending but i mean many things are possible the agency is quite uh, flexible so you know there is opportunity to send and host but we will see how it will go with which organization will send which will host we need to go case by case but the basic is written in everybody's uh, agreement yes the numbers countries yeah thank you andres um so yeah so just to to go back to the powerpoint so uh the young people have to be looking for an opportunity to help the wider community in europe and beyond uh, the idea of these volunteering activities are to be inspiring and empowering experiences and it's a concrete opportunity to learn new skills and maybe learn a language. That's a topic we are approaching a lot during yesterday and today, but it's still an opportunity. It's not like uh, an obligation for them to already have good language skills, but it's an opportunity for them to develop them. And uh, there's also organizations who can take part in EVS and ESC ranging projects, so supporting organizations. Um, so we also call them uh, sending organizations. Uh, and based, if they are based in home country, and they will help the participant prepare for the experience abroad. And there are also host organizations uh, who will receive and help um, the participant in the destination country. Okay, uh, and as for the implementing bodies, just a reminder that there are two types of implementing bodies for this kind of project, whether it be ESC or EVS. So there's the executive agency, uh, which is located in Brussels, and the role is, uh, as for the national agency in each program country, to promote the program, to support the applicants, to manage and follow up the application and the granted, uh, granted projects. So um, it depends on the on the applicate uh, applicate uh, the uh, organization app uh, applying for the project, but you can apply whether uh, in the executive agency in Brussels or in the national agency, depending on the course. Okay, is it clear? Just it's just a reminder to <laughs> to see where uh, we can apply for this type of opportunities. So we just can go on with participants with fewer opportunities. Uh, so the ESC, VS volunteering activities. So as we know, aim to promote social inclusion, to tolerance, to promote human rights and the value of differences and diversity of all kinds. Uh, and also to provide all young people equal access to opportunities offered uh, under the actions of ESC and EVS. Um, so there has been uh, uh, an inclusion and diversity strategy that has been developed uh, to support the organizations to better reach out to more participants with fewer opportunities and help addressing the barriers that different target groups may face. And so um, the definition uh, of young people with fewer opportunities is that there are young people who are disadvantaged compared to their peers and it's because they face one or more exclusion factors and obstacles. So these exclusion factors are, and it's not an exhaustive list, but uh, we have this one here. So disabilities, health problems, barriers linked to education and training systems, uh, cultural differences, social barriers, economic barriers, barriers linked to discrimination and geographical barriers. So this is in the guide, in the uh, EA, uh, European Solidarity Corps guide uh, that are listed uh, this, uh, for the participants with fewer opportunities. So I would just like to, to pause on this slide and, and just to see in your country, uh, 
um, what uh, fewer opportunities may come uh, or in your organization with which uh, participant do you work with most uh, which the, which uh, fewer opportunities are more uh, current uh, in the participants you are working with so it's just open to discussion just to see the differences maybe uh, in the organization and see how you prepare them uh, uh, before mobility so who wants to okay i think yeah, i can, Daniela, I can thank start you. um so uh in in terms of uh, participants it, it should be both as as a sending and as a hosting right yeah, yeah. okay <clears throat> yeah more or less the profile anyway is uh, more or less the same so um we generally involve uh volunteers with uh social barriers and economical barriers meaning that people coming from difficult backgrounds, so uh, people, I don't know, drop out from school or people with uh, difficult family uh, situation, people with um, economical issues uh, at home. Uh, barriers uh, linked to discrimination, we had a lot of them. And geographical barriers as well, so as, both as a sending and as a hosting. So when we send, uh, sometimes we have uh, participants who come from very remote village areas, we, who would not have uh, other uh, opportunities than than this than these ones, and when when we host uh, as well, many of the participants that we got, they come from very uh, re remote places. So uh, okay. this is one of the few opportunities that we can we can see. Um, cultural difference is a very uh, huge concept, so we use it very often. Uh, because like almost everything can go can go there it can be either a uh, linguistic barrier it can be uh, many many different elements uh, what we um, are not prepared to host are young people with uh, like physical physical or mental disabilities this is the only only limit that we uh, have generally we have been sending some volunteers with physical disabilities, but this requires a lot of preparation and a lot of structure that um, we that is a process that when we start it's a long, long term process and then for long term projects. So this will not be the case for a uh, short term time. Okay, thank you. Very I, I don't know if, if Caro wants to say something else or to. No, yeah, I wanted to, um, yeah, the, the, this point is important because we think that it's it's really important to understand the capacity of the organization where you are working for and in. So we realize that right now and for now, uh, uh, for us will be better uh, the, the, the thing that Daniela said because of, our capacity right now is the one to not work with especially physical and mental disability, but maybe in the future we will be, we will be ready to, to work with. But this yeah, is extremely important to understand and to be honest with, with yourself and with, with the partners that in this right now we, we, are, not, we are not going to work. Thank you very much. This is really the objective also to, to have this discussion all together because we need to foresee also the participants we will be able to host and send. So just to, to have another look of uh, our capacities of you know, within our own organization and uh, to send also the participant because we also have a lot of preparation to, to make with them and if we can send them, but if we don't have the resources uh, internally to prepare these participants, uh, we shouldn't do do so and and yeah so uh, any other organization wants to add something about your capacities and what participants do you work with on a daily basis and the ones you think you would be able to send with this project maybe I can share only just uh, yeah, something completely you. out of it. We have um, another project planning actually only for people with disabilities, like health uh, issues. And uh, there are only two volunteers included within this project. So I really can say that there's a lot of work for the preparation and also afterwards in the hosting organization. So it's really um, depending on your capacities. Uh, I just wanted to share that. Okay. 
maybe it would be helpful for someone to realize uh, how um, compli complicated and complex it could be as a process also that directly within the hosting organization. So yeah, there was, for example, changes uh, needed to be done, uh, like physical changes. So actually the volunteer could get in because she was in a wheelchair. So yeah, I uh, really to realize that. Yes, yeah, there are many factors to take into account, and it's exactly how we also work within ADIS, because if we feel like we don't have the capacity or we won't be able to provide all the necessary support to the participant, we prefer to be clear from the start and to say we won't be able to, to follow you on your project because we don't want to, to also give force up to, to the participant and say, yeah, we will try. But then after three or four months of uh, working with them, we say, well, uh, actually, we won't be sending you and we don't have anything to, to offer you. So we should just like be clear with the participants and identify from the start uh, what are our resources and what we are able to provide them. So to, to have a really, I don't know how you proceed uh, with uh, like to, when you first see the participants, but we try to have another look of their profile and also their some personal aspects. So of course we, we respect the uh, RGPD and, and everything, but the, the idea is really to, to know if we are capable on different aspects, whether it be personal, professional uh, ideas and objectives of the participants to have another look of their profile and see if they can fit a mobility project and if we have the capacity to, to follow them. Um, any other feedbacks on participants with fewer opportunities that you work with in your organization? Uh, sorry, yeah. I, I, I just want to add something uh, which is very, very relevant for us. Um, as I said, we, we are working with some uh, type of fewer opportunities, including health problems, um, but it's very, very important. And in case uh, we will develop, part, we're developing already partnerships with you. It's very important that the standing organization is aware that the volunteers have these kind of fewer opportunities and that they inform the hosting organization or the coordinating organization. Because we had a lot of cases in which we were hosting volunteers which, uh, who just forgot to tell us they had uh, major health problems. And then we got to know them only when it was a problem for the implementation of the activities. So, we want to uh, to say once more, it's very, very, very important. And we, we try to do the same as the standing organization. It's very, very important that we are in contact and that, and that we inform uh, the host in placement about the, the, the issues that the volunteer, not because we want to, uh, to prevent, to not include volunteers, but because we want to, to prepare as much as possible to have the best environment and to know that if something happens, it's, uh, it can be connected with a few opportunities that the volunteer has. Yeah, exactly. Because, for example, I, I've got a concrete example with a participant who had health problems, but he could like um, um, manage himself, let's say, and manage this problem. But uh, once uh, it became a huge problem uh, once on site because he's not in his uh, um, environment with his parents in his city and the medication and the doctor he's used to, to go to, it's totally different. Even though he can be managing himself in France, it, it's not the same whether it be in Italy or in Cambodia. It, it, it's really like really important to be fully transparent, even though it's a small health problem to just just be uh, informing the hosting also organization. And if something happens, they already know and they can manage easy, easily uh, the, the situation. Um, and with the parents also to, uh, I don't know how you, you manage, but we, we try to have a contact. We always have a contact person, but even more with the, these participants to have like a parent or a brother, a sister, whatever it be, but one contact person with whom we can, we can stay uh, in contact if we have any situation we are facing and who knows the participant and can uh, give some key uh, or tools or information to, to resolve some problem. Okay, any other feedback?
I can just maybe uh, say briefly something about uh, mental health issues these days yeah, yeah. of the young people. Uh, from our experience, I can say that uh, we, we had like, let's say, out of seven volunteers we hosted, five of them had uh, mental health issues. One of them was even diagnosed uh, of, uh, of a disorder. And uh, guess how many told us in advance? Zero. So the point is that uh, mental health, for example, in Czech Republic uh, is still taboo. It's something you don't talk about. It's something uh, pe young people think they should be ashamed of. And uh, they don't want to share this with you because they think you will not choose them for the project because they were facing depression last year, for example. So even if uh, what I'm, I can say like my experience, what I'm doing when I'm sending some volunteer abroad, I ask them like, I understand you just met me and you don't feel like sharing uh, that you, for example, have, uh, I don't know, mental, like depressions, for example, but I can just tell you what, what can happen if you don't tell me. So I tell them like story of, uh, of like one anonymous volunteer that they didn't tell us and it was really bad. And uh, then you have to really uh, not to, let's say like keep the fire, but you have to call the firemen, you know, because then the volunteers, they, when they go abroad and they, they have time to think about themselves, they're away from their friends and family. And they uh, even realize they have some mental health problems, even like worse than they thought that they have. And especially now uh, during COVID times, the mental health of all people. And uh, I think maybe especially like uh, young people, teenagers, let's say are like target group went uh, went worse so it's something also to be like ready that even though everything is nice uh, the volunteer says he is perfectly okay uh, he can come to your organization and after one month he tells you that i'm sorry i cannot come to work today because i have such a depression i can get out of my bed so it's something that we should have some plan for like to have at least some plan that to outsource some help to have some contact for English speaking uh, psychologist or psychotherapist to prescribe uh, something. So uh, yes, it's important to get this information in advance, but when it comes, for example, to this mental health, which is not like visible on the outside, many times, like in my case, 100% times, uh, they don't tell you in advance. So something uh, we should focus on uh, to have some plan B. And can I ask, can yeah. I ask our Asian partners to tell what's the uh, situation in their countries? Because uh, I, I know from Elishka, I mean, here in Europe, we hear it a lot in the studies about the mental health, but maybe you have some cultural differences or I know that uh, in some Asian countries, it's not polite to say something negative or, you know, you have, you know, maybe if there are some differences about the health, uh, mental health issues in your countries or... How is it? Can you share some experiences? Maybe the opponent, Jennifer, um, could you share uh, how it looks like? Yeah, sure, the opponent, go ahead. Just unmute yourself, okay. Um. Um, I would like to chair. Okay, okay. Uh, Jennifer, you can be first. Okay, Jennifer, you first. Here you go ahead. Okay, I, I go ahead. Okay, so uh, I would like to share my personal experience that uh, I once hosted uh, a girl, 18 years old girl, uh, and she when she was when she was in my family, she she was okay, but later she. She said that she had kind of a, a breakdown because she just got uh, heartbroken from from her boyfriend something. So I I didn't consider that as a, a mental health, but something that we can talk. And since she uh, since I take her to to talk with my students who are who are good at English, so they they could be friends. And I think that kind of uh, mental health or her her sadness would be going down, something like that. And in Thailand, when we have kind of mental health, we don't see a doctor or, or psychiatrist much. We feel like 
it's something that people will see as as uh, abnormal or strange. So we rarely talk to a family or friend instead of uh, seeing a doctor. So I think that is uh, from Thailand. Um, if you would like to add, you also can add. Thank you, Jennifer. It's your turn. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Actually, uh, we conducted a study last time about the uh, mental health situation in the Philippines. And basically, there are a majority of the youth and of course the youth workers have been experiencing um, this kind of low level of mental health. Right? Um, they are really thriving. Basically, when we talk of mental health, there are five categories, right? So most of them are thriving in the middle, the middle. Thriving to uh to to cope up with the uh, uh with the pandemics, the effects or the impacts of the pandemics, and uh, in terms of culture, we have this kind of um, stereotypes when we, when they talk about mental health, it's really uh, associated to uh, something physical or something really uh, transparent, the one thing that you can see immediately. But of course, uh, there is really a need for us in the Philippines to. To, to conduct numbers of seminars or webinars and training that would really uh, um, suggest or look into the awareness of the, the Filipinos when, in terms of mental health. Because when you speak of mental health, does it mean that you have disorder, like you have uh, schizophrenia or, or whatever? So that's uh, where we are struggling right now, that uh, we need to have a uh, uh, a, a training or seminar workshop or an awareness program that that uh, could uh, that could make more understanding for Filipinos. Yeah, so I'm looking at the actually the the, the studies that we have really from 200 participants from island of Luzon because there are three islands in the Philippines. Uh, majority really are thriving and the other one is surviving. Okay, and then some are actually struggling. Um, there is a little percentage about excelling. So we need, we need to work on this. So that's why we are very glad that we conducted this study so that in the next future um, training or uh, program, we could come up with better programs for them. Thank you anyway. Well, thank you for your contribution to both of you, Jennifer and Yapon. Um, if you all agree, uh, now it's like 10.08, uh, we would have a 15 minute break and then we will just continue. So let's meet at uh, 10.25. Okay, see you later, guys. Bye then. <laughs> it's the creepiest voice. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, now I will take the floor again. And uh, what I would like to cover in this uh, short part is the, um, uh, the difference between the paid staff and the volunteer and why this uh, part is uh, important to cover. Because uh, our organizations, we have, we are running different projects. Uh, we are hosting volunteers from different projects, also local volunteers. So it would be nice that uh, for this uh, EuroAsia 2 project, we would be on the same page and uh, we would kind of summarize what are the important steps that we need to take to follow the philosophy of the whole program that we discussed here before the characteristics of the volunteer, the philosophy, the fear opportunities and everything. So I just prepared uh, like two uh, short definitions from one is from uh, old Erasmus guide and one is from the European Solidarity Corp guide, which is the new volunteering program. But I think it's applicable also for our case now. So since uh, Andre had such a sexy voice for podcast, I would like to ask him to hear, uh, to, uh, to read for us the first print screen, the first paragraph, if you can read it for us, please. Oh my God, what just happened? But you know, um, my English is not so good. It's amazing. You know, you know who has very good English? Jennifer. 
Jennifer. Really? Please help okay. me. Okay. On they throw it on you. <laughs> Jennifer, can you please uh, read for us the first paragraph? Um. Avoidance of job su substitution. Volunteering activities must not substitute trainership or job so that any adverse effect on potential or existing paid employment is avoided. The involvement of volunteers should complement the work of paid staff. They should not replace paid staff or undercut their pay and conditions of service. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, let's read also the second paragraph. Maybe... Uh... Oh, maybe Hero, are you here with us? You should ask volunteers, Eliška. This is like in the school. I yes. have psychological problems. This is what the... <laughs> I, I hate is, this. Are there any volunteers? Yes, this is better. Just some. Volunteers. I can, I can. Oh so. my God, you are amazing people. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then the next. Okay. The following activities are not considered as volunteering activities within the framework of Erasmus Plus. Occasional, unstructured, part-time uh, volunteering, a work placement in an enterprise, a paid job, a paid job, a recreation of tourist activity, a language course, exploitation of a sheep work workforce, a period of study, or a vocational training abroad. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So uh, what the philosophy says or what are the rules that uh, the European Union doesn't want, unfortunately, it would be great, but no, they don't want to uh, fund us like uh, free employees for, uh, for our organizations. So that's why they stated these uh, strict rules that the volunteer who are coming uh, to volunteer for their organization shouldn't replace the, the paid staff. And... Uh, for example, from my experience, uh, you always have to like think like uh, what, where are the boundaries? It's uh, like nothing is like black and white. So uh, I would like uh, now to uh, have like brief discussion. Uh, if you if you see this picture, uh, what do you see? Can you just uh, unmute yourself and tell like what comes to your mind? What do you see on these two pictures? The people with pressure. People with pressure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Stress because of too much job. Stress because of too much job. Thank you very much. A possible burnout. Mm -hmm. Non cooperation. Mm -hmm. What else? What could be the story behind this? Uh, also, these uh, these pictures, like some brief. Why did this happen? Well, I'm just thinking that uh, maybe um, if we look about the pay staff and volunteer, maybe you just try to redirect all the work towards the volunteer so you can just shift your workload because you just go overwhelmed. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, for me, um, Eliska, um, um, I believe in a saying that volunteer is a matter of commitment and a passion. So mm -hmm. in this case, the worker, the worker here, or the volunteer here, is actually experiencing stress because he see or she sees the job in a different way, like in a in in in, in a form that he has to do it because he is paid. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Have you ever experienced something uh, like this in your organizations? For example, yourself or in your like previous jobs or your previous volunteering uh, experience when you were, uh, for example, in university or something like this? Do you have some personal experience that you could share? Yeah, I ever saw once like in, in the like uh, public school that I ever faced with my personal experience. They have like a lot of like old t-shirts. Uh, they, they like to give us like uh, a senior, senior like to give uh, a lot of job to like the freshman to work a lot of 
things like you are new, you have to train something like that. And then, but but we didn't want to do it. It's not it's not say a volunteer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other personal experience that uh, you would like to share? Yeah, maybe I can share mine. I don't. Know if you... I even have the mic. Um, yeah, when I was a student, I went for an internship in Morocco and uh, I was working with children and all the paid staff uh, left one by one. <laughs> and um, I wasn't supposed to be like with the children. I was supposed to be like doing cooperation and try to find fundings and everything. And I was just doing uh, the role of the educators, like from eight to eight. <laughs> And um, and I couldn't say no because I was like, but they need me because they are children, so they need people. And it's always this kind of situation when we, we don't know where the limit is because we don't know, we are like volunteers or interns and we don't know the role we should be taking if there's any problem in the organization because there's no limitation and it wasn't like we, we weren't really informed. And it's uh, like an emergency uh, situation and we don't know who to inform. And so we just take on the role. So there's mm -hmm. like when you leave this situation, you know how to prevent it later on. But sometimes you arrive on the field and if there are no limitation and um, rules or anything, you're, you're just like being... <laughs> Uh, submerged by, by everything and the workload and yeah mm -hmm. thank you very much anyone else would like to share some uh, some experience uh, I can share my experience from previous work um, actually it was just a small company and I felt exactly like the person on the first picture, not yet as the corpse, but still it was like, you're there like in a small company, just one person handling all the stuff. And then you just film all around all the time because it's impossible to do all the job yourself, especially when you are not the boss. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of an experience when you can come easily to a burnout or just to be like all around until here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, take a look on a, a different uh, a reality, a different environment. What can you see on these two pictures? How would you describe those? What comes to your mind? This is not reality. This is some fake actors who pretend they do something. <laughs> Are you saying this is from Pixabay, Photobank? I don't know. This is, I, as I said, these are some actors who pretend that they, they should look, that they look, do something. <laughs> no, I think that they just seem to be much more happy, just happier people than the other ones. They're having a team. You're not mm -hmm. alone to do your job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What else we can see here? This guy's... In the first picture, people have the same color, the same shirt, which gives me the idea of a group of people working together for the same topic, for the same aim. Yes, thank you. What uh, the organization had to do to make the volunteers feel like this? What do you think? What's the story behind these two pictures? Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm Hero. So I see in the picture that volunteers are doing their job in an enjoyable manner. Hello. So they enjoy, they enjoy uh, what Hello. they are doing. Hello. And the other picture shows that there is a guide or there is a proper program for the volunteer to uh, execute uh, her duties and responsibilities in organization and able to learn from his uh, from her mentor so basically um the organization should focus on the um program or the activities that will hone and that will um holistically uh, holistically um make these volunteers enjoy their uh, enjoy their undertakings thank you mm -hmm. thank you very much for your contribution 
Can you tell maybe your uh, personal experience as a hosting coordinator? What do you do to make your volunteers uh, feel like this or at least to be closer to this picture than to the other ones? I would say that is a uh, good communication, good guidance, mm -hmm. constant support from the teams. Mm -hmm. We are just printing the t-shirts. <laughs> t-shirts are important to give gifts, you know, to make the volunteer feel appreciated. <laughs> I think uh, the organization should have a framework or the flow chart in order to achieve this uh, picture, which is better than the previous one. So we should identify what are the objectives, how to execute them, what is the correct methodologies, and what will be the uh, personal in uh, per partake of the volunteers pertaining to the activities which is being done by the organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to have some like uh, guidelines. But about the guidelines, this is quite interesting um, because, uh, for example, the, um, the most experienced uh, host organization in Slovakia who hosts maybe 200 volunteers in the last uh, more than 15 years. So they, they said that the, they had like now really structured uh, guideline like day by day for for example the first week it's some uh, adaptation period and they, they wrote everything on a paper but i think it was kind of they they didn't like the idea at the beginning but i think our national agency was a little bit like um, forcing them to do it more structured you know all the time because they they said that at the beginning they work kind of by by heart that volunteer arrive and they know what to do with them and now they have everything written in like very detailed plan that they always follow. And also it's good for the new, when they have a new employees. So something like this, but it's, but it would be interesting to hear also from Vicolo Corto if you have such a like very structured uh, guide with like day by day, like, I don't know, adaptation week or something, something like this, or how you, how you work with uh, incoming volunteers, or maybe also from the Asian partners as well, if you have more experiences to share some examples. Okay, I can make a comment from the Kurokurta side. Um, we are hosting around, uh, hosting and coordinating around 35 volunteers per time in different realities in our region, Marques, so, Anyway, we try to, of course, work locally with them. Um, we have something structured, of course, like a welcoming week, kind of for the first week of the volunteer. But one suggestion in general we give, and one thing we do since years, is to try to um, plan the arrivals of the volunteer for each host reality, uh, not at the same time. In the sense that, uh, for example, if we host in the court of four volunteers per time, we try to um, divide the, the departure time, so to, to, make, to make them different. Uh, so the new volunteers that are arriving, let's, let's, let's think like a couple of volunteers arriving in the Colo Corto will have other two volunteers hosted from the Colo Corto that are living in the same accommodation and in the same city and so on, that are there since few months already and so on and so on. So every time new volunteers arriving in general in couples, have another couple of volunteers that are there since a while, that already know the city, that know a bit of the language, that know a bit of the rules of us, uh, the accommodation, uh, the, the, the activities, the place, the, the, how to get to the place and so on. Uh, we, we realize that this is, is really effective for the arrivals and welcoming of the volunteers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh... I would like to maybe focus now on the difference uh, a little bit back uh, on the difference of the paid staff and the and the volunteer. So uh, could you maybe share like uh, your experience uh, 
how do you approach differently the volunteers and for example your colleagues who are like paid staff in your organization what are the main uh, differences in your approach for example Actually, I can share my, my, my personal experience in, in Vicolo Corto. I was on my EVS uh, in 2013. It was a short-term one. So when I, when I was back, I physically knocked to Vicolo Corto's door because it was my sending organization. It was in my city. And I started to volunteer locally. Uh, so with them as, as a local one, as a local volunteer. And, after a bit of time, I started to, to have always and always some important tasks and I became, I think, uh, the first um, officially paid and uh, I don't know how, part of the staff. So it was a really, really nice thing to start from EBS, to come back, to start to do something locally and then <clears throat> make it become a job. Right now, we are uh, five working people in the association. Uh, unfortunately, right now, in this precise moment of our, of our story, we don't have much local volunteers that are following us. We are trying to, to build up a strategy to find youngsters that, as I was at the time, can be interested in starting something with us. We have the same issue. <laughs> yeah. but because, because we are extremely convinced of the fact that, first of all, if you act as a volunteer, then it's nice that this became a job, no? that you build up your, your professional career also on this. But first of all, the volunteering part is necessary. I don't know what's going on with the youngsters right now and also COVID didn't help of course in any in anything of this so if you have any suggestion on how to build a volunteering local community we are really pleased to hear I think they're also struggling with the same thing just reaching the youngsters um, I don't know what's the issue with them exactly like you say it's really hard to come to them and I feel like after one year being on the computer and other things they're just not there to be reached out i don't know <laughs> not via social media not via other events so yeah definitely i think to uh, discuss or maybe elaborate in the upcoming days it's a bit reassuring for us also because to hear you now because uh, i don't know if uh, if we have talked about it before but we work with uh, service civic so uh, they they work with us like in addis so there are volunteers here and they work with the volunteers we are sending and everything and normally we have a lot of applications to become uh, to have this position within addis and we have been publishing the two or three offers for like three months and we we can't find any volunteers uh, to be involved and it's the first time it's happening Normally we have like 15, 20 <laughs> right at the beginning uh, application and we don't know how to choose them. And now we don't have anything. So I don't know what's happening, but it's a bit reassuring to, to hear you <laughs> saying that you are struggling also to find new volunteers because um, yeah, it's really weird for us to, to be facing this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is maybe uh, another project topic. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I just I don't want to escape from this uh, from this topic. So if we can back to it again, uh, can you uh, let's have like one more contribution? Then we can conclude uh, this uh, short session. Uh, if you can tell me like some short example, what is the difference? How do you approach your uh, paid uh, colleague who's working with you in the organization and how do you approach the volunteer? For example, uh, you get some tasks, let's say there's some new project. So uh, can you give us example, how do you approach your uh, colleague and how do you approach the volunteer? Well, I don't know, for me, um, like with staff, they are employed to do the work. So we can have a discussion about like uh, if they are willing to do it, but sometimes you, you can impose the, the work 
uh, when it's with volunteers, you have to see if they they fit uh, the the activity, if it's within their competencies, and you cannot like impose things on them. You have to discuss it with them and and offer them the activity and see if they agree to do it, or maybe you have to change some plans. But it's not yeah, it's not the the same. You cannot impose as you can do with staff because it's within their work field and within their work uh, obligations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, in my case, I Elisa. Um, in my case, uh, I I really work um, more in, in a collaborative environment. I always ask them first, um, what are their their skills? Okay, what do we need to or what do you want to contribute? Okay, but specifically, I, I focus more on the skills so that I could identify what project what projects or specific services uh, she or he, he would like to contribute in our organization. So basically, I always ask them to, to work as a team. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, it would be nice to have some like, uh, at least uh, not like, sorry, no, 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 no. yes not like uh, concrete like guidelines, but maybe just uh, to summarize some uh, tips for the future, but because maybe we will host the volunteer in, uh, in a year, let's say we don't know uh, because of the COVID, so we might uh, forget what we were discussing here. So uh, if you could just uh, take a look uh, on this Jamboard and if you have some like uh, idea how to ensure that uh, when you will host the volunteer, you will not uh, make him, uh, let's say, unpaid employee, but he will really remain the volunteer according to the EVS philosophy. So uh, if you have some tip uh, that you follow and or you can also recommend to others, uh, you can put it here on a uh, post-it. For example, we were mentioning the teamwork, right? that uh, the volunteers work more in the team. So I can edit here. Uh -huh. You were also mentioning uh, guidance, right? To guide them more. Yes, having something more structured. Mm. Yes, yeah, structured program. Mm -hmm. What else we can do? Mm -hmm. Discuss their work hour day, few hours, fewer hours than uh, paid staff. Mm -hmm. Delegate tasks in relation to the skills they, they can offer. So let's say they uh, they have some like design tasks before coming to your organization, for example, to work with social media and to promote your events. So then uh, uh, probably they are not ready to work uh, in the garden and uh, water the flowers, for example, because, for example, they don't have the skills for it. Mm -hmm. Ask them for some contributions and personal projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice to give them opportunity to have their own initiative uh, and uh, do something they figure out like what they would like to do. And there's also some benefits to the organization or to the local community. So it's uh, to give them chance to do something meaningful for them and also for the, for the organizations or your like local town or your village. Activities should be sustainable with or without the volunteers. That's a really nice comment. So uh, our national uh, agency always giving us a tip if you to, to help us to, to distinguish between the employees and the volunteers is like, if this project or activity would be, uh, we could realize, uh, like make it happen uh, without the volunteers as well. So it means if uh, we wouldn't have the volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do it. We should think about it if uh, they are not actually substituting some uh, some uh, employee that, uh, for example, we don't have money for. 
Yeah, so this is also a nice, uh, nice tip to, to think about it in this way. Uh, promote leadership over bossy. Yes. <laughs> uh, create opportunities for staff and volunteers to better understand each other's uh, roles. Yeah, it's also good that uh, maybe uh, you are the coordinator of the volunteer, but your other colleagues, they, they are on different projects. Maybe they don't work with volunteers at all. So that they're also familiar with the philosophy. So they don't take them, for example, as interns, uh, that they're there for coffee or, uh, or coffee machine. So just to make them familiar, even though they're not including directly in the project. So it helps that they also are aware why they are there and what they're supposed to do and, and how, what is the meaning of it behind this. Uh, support related to the work, but uh, as well for the social life. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, for example, in our organization, the biggest difference between uh, the volunteer and the employee from this point of view is that we also care like if the volunteers are happy in their personal life. Of course, I care if my colleague because she's my friend, if she's happy, but uh, if uh, the, the volunteers are, for example, unhappy or you see that they're isolated, uh, also to take a look on this uh, at this like more like personal level and to see if there's something you can help them with, which is something you usually don't do with your employees, but it's something that uh, I'm used to, my, me personally, to do with, uh, with our volunteers. Mm -hmm. Present them the activities uh, of the organization and ask them and mentor them which ones uh, would fit best for them to be included in. Uh, exactly, so I think uh, this can be also done before coming there or that we design the activities for the project. So in advance, we can discuss with them uh, if they really understand what they will do, what we can offer them. So when they come for this uh, short term uh, volunteering project, uh, they already know like uh, that what they are offered, what they can do, what they can offer to us. Talk with paid staff uh, that volunteers are their helpers, assist are their helpers assisting not their real paid co-workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to inform them about the, the philosophy, establish a good communication. Yeah, to be open with the volunteer and yeah. Uh, also to, uh, I would add one post it uh, to, how to, to kind of stress out their uh, learning process. Yeah, when you have an employee, uh, you maybe think less about how much they're learning at work, but then you have the volunteer, you have to take care of, of their learning process, that uh, they are there to learn. It's one of the objectives of the program. Yeah, so the learning process is uh, kind of a priority for the, for the volunteer. Ooh. You can also add uh, things later on to the to the Jamboard and uh, after this uh, training will be over, I can uh, prepare some like more structured uh, guide based on the outcomes of this uh, session and uh, I can share the few on our shared folder for this project. So we can also have a look at it when we will actually host the volunteers to remind ourselves. <laughs> So uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, do we want to have like short break or do we want to continue with uh, one more workshop from me? It's a case study of selection of the volunteers and then Amelie, she also has something, right? Yeah, maybe we can continue because I, I'm afraid that if we have another break now, <laughs> We okay. will uh, finish too late. Uh, I know about everyone, but okay. I think let's... we can manage uh, yeah. have like this twenty-minute workshops that you are yeah. talking about. Uh, so maybe you can uh, give us the assignment. We will do this uh, workshop, and then uh, we will have a break. Okay. Okay. So let's go for it. So uh, we were discussing like how the volunteer should look like. What is the philosophy? And uh, now the heart. Uh, task uh, comes to change uh, some other people's lives basically 
and uh, I would like you to uh, go in, let's say, uh, three uh, small groups. Uh, you will get uh, two CVs and two applications of two like anonymous uh, volunteer, like potential volunteers who are applying uh, for the project. They would like to come to your organization to volunteer. And uh, as it usually happens, uh, you have uh, uh, more candidates than you have uh, the placement. So you have to decide who would you like to choose. Now we were talking about some characteristics criteria. So now it's the time to apply what we have discussed uh, so far. Uh, you will get two, C two, uh, two series of two people. You can choose only one. So uh, here on this Jamboard, uh, I can also copy paste the links here. You, you can uh, see, wait, 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 there's the chat. Yes. This is CV and application number one. Let me know if you can reach it. And this is CV and application number two. It should be in PDF, so you should see it clearly. Uh, let's have... Uh, 10 minutes uh, in, uh, in the groups where you can discuss uh, which volunteer you would like to choose. So you have to first decide who. So you have to make some consensus because let's say in your organization, you are also not just one man, but uh, you are a team. So you have to make some uh, consensus to make an agreement. And then I would like you to, uh, group number one will just post a name uh, of the person that you chose. So either Anna or Paul. And uh, on the last uh, two uh, slides, I would like you to put, uh, for example, why did you choose Anna or why didn't you choose her? So then we can have some uh, brief discussion, like what were your arguments, yes or no. So it would be really interesting to see uh, your ideas or your thinking and your procedures. And Eliska, I'm just mm -hmm. reading and uh, in the, the CV and this application form. But uh, can you tell us something more about the receiving organization uh, or the like the hosting place? Because I don't see you. Um, it's you. It's you. Like uh, you will be in the groups. So. Aha! But what should be the task of the volunteers in the organization? Do you know? Uh, it, let's imagine that you are one organization. Let's say uh, you will be in group uh, VSC organization and mm -hmm. Addis, so you can make some consensus. And you can also, uh, then on the last two slides, you can put uh, why yes, why no. So for example, why you would choose her because she would be good for this type of activity. So but it's something, can... it's something related to marketing. Because you ask it here, do you have marketing? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, based on the last uh, Your Asia One uh, project. Uh -huh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. something with marketing related. Yes. Okay, so yeah. ready, guys? Welcome, welcome. Guys, did you manage in such a short time? I know the time was deadly, but did you manage or? No. Yeah. Last, last second we choose, but yeah. <laughs> so you have to imagine that uh, you're getting so many uh, CVs and cover letters and you have just limited time to view them all. So uh, sometimes us coordinators, we are under pressure, of course. So uh, let's see, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. we can see everything. So uh, group one, you vote for Paul CV. What about group two? I think we were actually the group two together with Andre, Daniele, and Niang. Option three. <laughs> <laughs> Daniele, Daniele, tell about your option three. That's a good point. Very oh, deep. I mean, we were uh, discussing that both profiles are very similar to each other. So there is no mm -hmm. uh, big difference. At least from our from our point of view, mm -hmm. and I was just putting on the table that from my point of view, um, if I had to choose, I would not choose uh, no one of them mm -hmm. because both of them look overskilled 
for volunteering op opportunities. And as they, because one of the questions that we ask ourselves and we ask the volunteers is like, it's like, would this person have another opportunity in life to do this? If we are not choosing them as a, as a volunteer this time, how they, their life would look like? And we often ask, what is your plan B? So what, what, what happens if you don't get selected? And in, in these cases, most probably, they will have the opportunity by themselves to do where, whatever they want and to go wherever they want. So if I had a third option, I would probably go for the third one. So yeah, we, we were discussing about this. Uh, and so we didn't come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay, but thank you very much. It was very, very interesting because uh, uh, Neang, yeah, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly, uh, she was um, saying that um, she was surprised that we think they were over skilled. So I don't know if Neang, you want to say something because unfortunately we didn't have enough time to, to discuss about it. Well, to me, uh, that is okay. It's like uh, if I would choose, I would choose uh, the, the male candidate. Um, yes. <laughs> it's difficult, right? <laughs> Changing people's lives. <laughs> yes, uh, because it's like uh, I'm not uh, in the, not yet in the field or in the uh, qualification of selecting someone I am in the process of learning or someone who apply for scholarship not the one who select the um, volunteer like that so I've been learning uh, during the session actually <laughs> but what we were seeing actually uh, was we actually liked better the girls CV because it was more sympathetic we would say it has nice colors we had her picture uh, and it changed a lot and also in the uh, um, what is it? In the registration form, there were like smileys uh, in it. So she was kind of more warm to us uh, already from the paper. That's one thing. So yeah, probably if we would be sharing or choosing somebody for uh, another position or paid position, we would probably choose her. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so let's also let the first group to tell us how, uh, how was the selection process in your group? How did it go? Why did you vote for Paul CV and not for Anna? What made the difference? Is it us, I think, the group one? Group one, yeah. Uh, yeah, because or I just wanted to uh, do it briefly, but then group two started talking, so I also want to give you opportunity to say something. Yeah, actually, I don't remember, I think, is it us, but we didn't, we didn't fulfill anything because also we found out that the CVs were pretty similar and we were like, ah, okay, so where we are going for? Um, but basically, uh, First of all, we would like, of course, to have an interview with them and not choosing based on the CV. But if we have to, to choose or to, to, to finalize somehow the selection, basically, we noted two things. The first one is that Paul had a little bit of more international experience. And as we stated yesterday at the real beginning, maybe for these kind of projects, even if short with this strong uh, intercultural shock because they are in Asia or from an Asian in, uh, in Europe and so on, maybe a bit of international experience is needed, previous one. Uh, second, we based our, our fact on our vote, let's say, on the fact that uh, Paul stated that he had volunteering experience in the past, while Anna had a volunteering experience like coordinator, so not really on the, on the field of, of volunteers. So we say maybe Paul uh, did, was already a volunteer himself, she, she wasn't so maybe we, we, we it, it would be better if you already had an experience like this. But yeah, it was really hard and of course not, not to do only on the CVs. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, let's leave the third group. We choose Paul as well. Okay, so what made you choose uh, Paul over, over Jana, uh, Anna, sorry. It was actually not an easy de decision because we were 
uh, agreeing on both CVs because uh, we felt that she had a lot of competencies and both work and uh, study experience in the field, whether we didn't see it uh, not as much in marketing for Paul, but we, we we were thinking we want to see more than the CV, like a cover letter, because we need to to see the motivation behind that. Uh, why does he want to to be involved in this volunteering activity in this specific field? But we felt that like she had experience and she knows the um, the field and everything. And um, let's say what is the added value for her to still be uh, doing this uh, volunteering when she has a lot of experience and studies in the field. So maybe there would be more an added value for him to be involved and to change maybe or uh, have new skills in marketing, for example. But it wasn't easy at all to, <laughs> to choose between the two of them. So maybe some other people from my group wants to add something. No, it's okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to briefly conclude, because we're running out of time. Fun fact uh, that, uh, yes, it was difficult because uh, these two CVs, they're real CVs that uh, we got for the EuroAsia one. I wasn't the one choosing because I wasn't in an organization yet. So I'm just speaking from experience from my uh, previous uh, colleagues. But it was like this, it was really difficult because uh, all people who uh, applied, uh, they were really motivated and skilled and everyone had some plus. So it was like this, it was super difficult. There were just like few CVs we could filter out at the beginning because we were like, no, this is some kind of, uh, you know, he was boss of some company, so definitely no, you know. So only like few people we could filter out uh, based on the EVS philosophy. And then it was really difficult to choose. And fun fact uh, that uh, in reality, we chose uh, Anna. Her name was Hanka, I think. <laughs> so as you say, it's, uh, it's uh, really difficult. And um, yeah, you saw that you didn't have enough time for it. So it takes also time to, to discuss. But you cannot probably in real life to have interview with everyone. Because if you have like 100 applicants, you cannot have uh, Skype with everyone. So you will have to probably like filter also people out before the Skype. So it's maybe good to in advance to set some like priorities and some criteria. So you also choose the volunteers within your team uh, like transparently and uh, also with also discussion with the hosting organization. Yeah, so then it's also up to the agreement of the sending and the hosting organization, how the selection process works what are the common like requirements and, uh, and the criteria. So, uh, but yeah, it, uh, this uh, exercise just was supposed to show you that uh, it was difficult because after everything we learned uh, today and yesterday about uh, the philosophy of this program and the purpose, then it's, uh, then it's really difficult. So thank you very much for your uh, contributions. And uh, now I will give floor to Amelie. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if Michaela, you wanted to have the break now or not. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know, Amelie, how much uh, how much um, longer is the workshop, but I would suggest that it's already 11.30. So yeah, there's a brief uh, intro from Amelie, and then we'll go to the case study from Trunk. So yeah. yeah. So, um, as we don't have much time, uh, I will uh, just present you a video that is summarizing uh, what I was supposed to present, but still uh, the presentation is already up on the on the Google Drive and I think Michaela will also share again all the content that we, we will uh, see this week. So, you will have the more detailed PowerPoint on uh, the EuroAsia folder on uh, the Google Drive, but I will just show you the video for now. And so, Trang can present uh, their uh, activity and, and we can finish before 1 p.m. or something uh, in our time. Okay, so I just share the video now. And tell me if you've got the sound, uh, if it's okay for you. 
A high quality yes, the sound is management there. is crucial to ensure the success of the project and to have a Sorry, sorry, I'm trying to Okay. A high quality Ah, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> A high quality volunteering management is crucial to ensure the success of the project and to have a real impact on the volunteer within the organization and the local community. The four steps to manage a high quality volunteering project. To formalize the volunteering project. To host the volunteer. To ensure the follow up of the volunteer and to evaluate the volunteer project. Before the arrival of the volunteer, you need to formalize the project by signing an agreement with the sending partner and the volunteer. This agreement must be signed by the three parties before the beginning of the project. The agreement describes the mission of the volunteer, the project modalities, as well as the rights and duties of each person. Everybody must read carefully the agreement and agree to respect it. Also, you need to define an ethical charter. Make sure that the volunteer knows the codes of conduct and the values of the organization. Finally, you need to communicate regularly with the sending organization and the volunteer. To prepare the project, the communication between the mentor of your organization, the sending organization and the volunteer must be flowing and regular. Communicate clearly to answer all the questions and to better prepare the project. The hosting organization must facilitate the arrival and the induction of the volunteer. Organize a welcome briefing during a couple of days. The objective is to introduce your organization the staff, the project, the partners, the work environment, the living conditions, and the local cultural context. This welcome briefing can also include elements about safety and security. Within your structure, the mentor designated for the volunteer will ensure their follow-up all along the project. The organization of regular meetings and the availability of the mentor will help to anticipate and to resolve any difficulties. At a professional level, you need to evaluate the progress of the project, the achieved results and to set new objectives. At a personal level, it's the occasion to measure the well-being of the volunteer, their stress condition, their integration in the staff and in their new living context, and their possible difficulties. The midterm project is a key step. You need to organise a special meeting, a midterm meeting, to evaluate the acquired skills by the volunteer and to set new objectives for the end of the mission. At the end of the mobility project, you need to organize a final evaluation meeting with the volunteer. Evaluate the mission of the volunteer and discuss with them the question of their return in their home country. Also evaluate the project with the sending organization. Internally, reassess the needs of your organization and of the local community with your staff. And if necessary, define a new vacancy announcement and a volunteer profile. To obtain long-term results and a sustainable impact in your community, it's essential to ensure a high-quality management of the volunteers. Okay, so as you can see, it's still the same kind of videos that uh, I presented yesterday, but it summarized every, <laughs> every step, but it's more like in the point of view of the hosting organization now. Uh, but still, I think that uh, we still have some things to say about also the, um, for example, the sending organization when on, on upon return to have like a, also a sort of a meeting with the participant or training to, to really see the skills that were developed and what can be foreseen for the participant later on. So um, I will, uh, you can uh, find the information on the, on the Google Drive and there's more detailed information also on the PowerPoint about certain aspects. So yeah, I don't know if you have any question about this or if you want to discuss some, some part of the videos or if not, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and I will pass the floor to Tang um, um, and that's it for me. Uh, thank you, Emily. I would just like to add, if you can go through the presentation after training and have a look on it and maybe prepare the questions. Uh, if you have any uh, for the next time that we'll be here also with Emily, then uh, maybe we can answer the questions all together. So you have still like three days if anything comes to your mind. Okay, Trang, uh, we're looking forward to your case study. Here to you.
Can I share my screen? Yes. yes. Thank you. So this is a logistic uh, package of our organization. And I will show you the last year first. So last year, we uh, we did have two volunteers uh, who did uh, go to do volunteer activities in uh, Vietnam in uh, two months, yes. And this is the package we organized for them is including the name of the organization we host them and uh, the accommodation arrival welcome briefing orientation the safety security uh, weather food and something they need to to be to, to know before departure so our, i would like to introduce first thing about the case study from last year first um, we have two host uh, organization last year the first one is IMACTO. That is an organization of support for the disabled people uh, in Vietnam. Uh, here it is. Yeah. So, if, um, sorry, I, 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 it's in the end of the document. And the second one, that is the Green Hub. The Green Hub is a uh, mission is the focus on the green mission about the environment to make the planet green again. Exactly, uh, we have uh, uh, there is one participant from Green Hub today, but I think she left because of her uh, some uh, personal job. So here it is. Uh, we have we have the package about the introduction about the organization where uh, and who they are and uh, what kind of job or list of service so they exactly can see what they need to do and also they can have like an overview or, um, uh, of the um, yeah of the, uh, the, uh, the hosting organization and also here we see the Vietnam uh, a little bit like a very short introduction about Vietnam where it is and they can find the map or uh, in where it, exactly Vietnam in the Southeast Asia, the time zone, so they can figure around what time in their home hometown and in Vietnam, they can change their time. And about the weather is a very important thing for all of the, uh, I mean, the Europe and the Americans, uh, I mean, the people not from Asia, because in Vietnam, the weather is quite, is one of the shocking thing for all of the people. And it, the weather is very humid. In uh, the winter, it autumn is okay, but in the summer, it's uh, like a disaster. And the bank, the ATM, they can find information here about uh, like a, a Visa card or a MasterCard. Can I use in Vietnam? Yes, you can. And how much is it? And the, how much is the cost when the chart is here? And the safety, the security uh, is all in here. In HXD, um, we have only one party about political party system and uh, which does not welcome dissent. Internal conflict is rare, exactly. Hanoi is our capital and that which is quite safe but sensible precaution for protect yourself on and your belongings would be highly recommended because sometimes you can find the pickpocket on the uh in the public uh transport like a bus or the crowded area like a train about electricity uh electricity in vietnam is 220 volts alternating at the 50 cycles per second if you travel to Vietnam with a device that does not accept uh, uh, 220 volts. You will need a voltage converter, Vietnam plug adapters and outlet shapes like uh, we recommended in the picture here. And about Hanoi, Hanoi that it will be, at this moment, we are not sure uh, uh, we still discuss with our partner 
because we are not sure that uh, they will be they will bond, do volunteer in Hanoi or at other places because we have some different partners, not only in Hanoi, but uh, along the north of Vietnam. So maybe they will go to the mountainous area. Uh, so this is a short introduction of Hanoi, where it is the capital of Vietnam, and how to travel in Hanoi accommodation place, uh, such as how to travel in Hanoi by bus, by normal traffic is very easy, by taxi <clears throat> and some caution. If you travel with the taxi, because sometimes they will cheat you. So we all alert it here. The local transport, what a uh, local cheapest or transport uh, possibilities, where to take them. And here, this is the guy, uh, the instruction. And the, also you can find the link to buy the bus ticket for very cheap one and trusty website. And the, find the bus route that here, uh, also, don't trust the bus in Vietnam. Sometimes the bus timeline is not never, never, never correct because they're always late because of uh, uh, traffic jam. And you can use a Google Map and also another methods, another options for for travel, for transport, such as like you can use a Grab is a one of the mobile app uh, for with a motorbike or car or taxi. Yeah, Uber is now not available and food mm, the typical vietnamese meal include meat and vegetable either eaten with a chopstick yes we eat a chopstick that is two sticks and rice and wrote in the rice paper or red uh, or green left uh, the lettuce and deep in the sauce we call fish sauce and uh, so don't eat, if you want to, if you don't want to eat with the chopstick, you can bring a fork and a knife or no worry about this because you can buy the fork and knives at uh, your accommodation. Or you can buy it very cheap one at the supermarket. Mm, here it is some local uh, supermarket and like a 20, uh, 24 seven hour. And like a PV Mart or Vinmart. Uh, uh yes, um, Seven Eleven you can find everywhere. Also, okay, and the standard. What are the standard living costs like a raw accommodation, grocery, restaurant, local transport, or other goods and service? Uh, you might need. So this is the normal meals for per person per meal. It's just fifty thousand dong to seventy thousand dong. That is a, at the like bistro, and it's around equal with the like two dollars or three dollars and the restaurant is about 10 to 15 us dollar per person at the restaurant and the working accommodation about your stay uh so before because the last year the volunteer stay with the host family this is an this is an apartment and it just fine to 10 minutes walk to your email to office that is a one of the organization and exactly they can walk it's not a fancy apartment but the host family is extremely friendly and hospital they do not have ic but have fan and uh that time at that time when they travel to vietnam that is a winter time so it's really cold in Hanoi. so ac is no problem there is a computer out in the living room, which uh, they can use if they want. Internet is available all the time, no time required for coming back home or leaving home. So they have freedom to come back home at whatever time. And they will have their own room and, and share the living room, bathroom and kitchen with the host family. People in the, friend, in the building are really close to each other as well. Therefore, they may have many new friends, the director and the chairman of Imata live in the same building. So they can discuss if they want to understand more, or uh, if they want, they can hang out together. About food, um, and so, so great is that Imata provides them mon monthly allowance for their lunch at the office. And yes, they will give them the money for mon monthly spending, like a dinner and breakfast. Uh, they can have dinner with their host family or 
uh, just need to tell them if they are okay with it or if they want to cook by themselves. So basically they are free to do things accordingly to their plan. Or the last year, exactly, we have two accommodation for them. The first accommodation is an uh, in an apartment, a uh, private one, the first one. And they have the private room and uh, uh, private, uh, oh, everything is private and private kitchen. So sometimes they cook together and sometimes they cook by themselves. Sometimes our assistant come and uh, yes, the staff come and uh, just to check if they need help and we cook together. And this is the accommodation picture. You can see here, uh, in case, if this year or next year, the volunteer go to the north of Vietnam, like the mountainous area, so they still have their own room and their toilet inside. And yeah. So it's really depend on wh where is the host organizations. Uh, so we will arrange the best thing we can. And also our, yeah. Accommodation address the last time is not so far. And we also uh, do it. It was a person in charge of this of this uh, project last year. So she did arrange an accommodation very nearby in the walking distance. So very easy and comfortable for volunteer can walk from the apartment to uh, the office. And also the walking station. Yeah, we did uh, describe a very short description description here the desk and the working time, uh, such as here we rise it from eight thirty to seven thirty. But the volunteers can register for suitable time language for working is English, and working task. Um, their working task is they will work like a uh, marketing assistant on the website, FB and publication. So this is the name of the volunteer and also the experience describe a little bit uh, experience from uh, foreign volunteers in 65 days working with the Green Hub. Green Hub is one of the organization, the hosting organization last year with EMATER for green environment mission. Yeah, and the proposed task. And this is about two months of volunteering working period. And the, also the uh, on the arrival training. So we can have the pickup uh, at the airport and a guidance to travel to Hanoi accommodation location. And the low, the person within chat, like uh, to pick up, that is from hosting organization, you see the doctor. And the evening, uh, general, after arrival to one or two nights. So uh, we will have the general orientation. And, uh, and we will orient, uh, give them some briefing uh orientation about the uh, the everything and if they have further question or something they can ask we are very welcome uh and then the training uh, session one so yes and this is we give them also the social net network for foreigner in hanoi so they can join uh if they want to ask something or if they want to hear the experience from some someone who stayed in vietnam or in, who or who are had uh, have worked in vietnam or if they want to travel or visit somewhere and also we uh in uh, yesterday we had, did have some volunteers and our volunteer also uh guided them around hanoi in uh, some place uh, to travel together and yeah and also just uh, the last information uh, about the oh what to pack so we we give them some uh, suggestion um, because in Vietnam it's very hot 
So in the summer, you can see that we wear the sun coat uh, to protect the skin or they can use the sun cream. Or, yeah. And packet next. Um, flip flop is one of suggested one <laughs> because uh, uh, some you know that when you enter in 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 the house of Vietnam in my country you need to put the shoe out so shoe off so uh, it's better to wear flip flop than the shoe and safety uh, about the medical, physical, diarrhea, and other personal consideration. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is some, um, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the volunteer will need to sign you know, one uh, document that, about their health condition, or they need to buy the health insurance um, before travel, before like, departure and traveling. Uh, telephone calls, but um, no worry about that. And, and also we give them some daily conversation so the volunteer can learn. And just some simple words like a xin chào, hello, or goodbye, or see you again. Just some, because in, in uh, the people here are very friendly, but is they more friendly if someone or the foreigner can speak a few language like, um, to Vietnamese to communicate with them, they can think, they can do. Oh, that is a new like a, a new connection between the 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 volunteer and the local. Yeah. So if you have any Q and A, so I'm I'm very good to to answer. Thank you for sharing track with us. Uh, I will be happy if you can share also the documents so I can have a look on how actually yeah, sure. that is done. Yeah, um, sure. And um, we have uh, still a few minutes to go and Andre prepared a brief activity for you to think about logistics as well, and not only to think about a selection procedure. So Andre, here to you. Uh, I'm, oh, he already posted the gem board for you so you can go to chat and open it. And yes. uh, so what are we going to do, Andre? Yes, so thank you very much for sharing. This was really interesting. I feel like being in Vietnam now. I think about the only Asian restaurant in my local town, uh, where is a Vietnamese uh, guy. And when I go there, I say this Xin Chao. Now I try to write it. Thank you for this uh, small <laughs> vocabulary. And you are right. Then when I told him Xin Chao, he is so friendly to me. Now he greets me even the, in the local Tesco. Like, I feel like part of Vietnamese community in my town. It's, it's, it's really nice. No, but yeah, I had a chance to be in Vietnam for one week, two years ago with the first uh, edition of the program. So oh. it was nice to see a complete info pack. And to be honest, I feel like going there again now, if I could be volunteer again, it's amazing. All these uh, di di uh, dif uh, differences as well, it's so exciting. So I feel, I feel super motivated to go. On Friday, I have my second vaccination. So <laughs> then I will be yeah. more ready to travel. <laughs> what, how how Rob about- Star Wars, Yes. And how is it with vaccination in your countries? It's like a side question. For example, uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for Vietnam, uh, exactly now we, um, the because of the new, of COVID, uh, I don't know, Delta, yes. So because of that, so so there are, there are so many patients of the COVID-19 in the South of Vietnam now. We have never seen any like a 300 or 600 or 100 cases of COVID per day. But now we can see that is a, uh, like a 1,000 people with a positive result of the COVID-19. That is really, really uh, bad things. So mm -hmm. uh, often the government, they, they bought a vaccine uh, from uh, Europe and from US and they, they have a plan that is to, to, to uh, 
uh, give the vaccine for someone like your vulnerable people first, uh -huh. like uh, the people in the yeah. Yes, so Tranka, thank you very much for sharing. So I see some of you already opened this Jamboard, very good. So you just need to go to the very last, um, very last, what is it? Page, page number nine, where you see this A and B. And yesterday I really liked this activity with choosing between A and B. So uh, like some uh, statements uh, that are uh, like kind of extreme statements, A or B. So we will do the same activity. I already see Michaela. So you can make your own, um, um, what is it? My English, so, my English so bad today. <clears throat> your own sticker. Carolina, yes. Oh, Michaela, thank you very much. Stickers. Those are stickers. So <laughs> thank you very much. Just put in your day name. I will be sharing the screen, and Andre will be giving you a question. Ah, sharing the screen. This is uh, this is this is amazing, amazing suggestion. Uh, 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 you are sharing the screen. Yes, I'm sharing the screen. So we have it actually. Thank also you registered. very much, Michaela. This is amazing. So I see a lot of a lot of people coming. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, here in the middle, in the green part, uh, I will post the questions and you can choose. It's all connected with the logistic. And um, as yesterday, if you put your sticker on the very left side to the A, it means that you uh, really agree with the statement A. If you put it in the very B, you agree very in the B. If you put it somewhere in the middle or a little bit to the B, to the A, that's what you think. So there is also the option C in the middle. So without further, for the comments, let's go to the very first question. Here it comes one more time. Uh, here it is. I hope you can read it. Sorry, so A is for uh, uh, agree and B is disagree and C in the middle, that is a, like a neutral, right? Yes, yes, I will now read it for you. So statement uh, A is that the sending organization chooses the volunteer. And the statement B is that the host organization chooses the volunteer. We can speak about our future plan. For example, the Asian partners or the European partners, you want to host the volunteer, you want to send the volunteer. What is your common procedure? We don't have to make some theory like a real practice or how do you imagine in this project? What would you prefer? What how do you usually work? But yes, in this concrete project with Asian partners, European partners, choosing, hosting, sending, no. And then please, uh, we are already a nice team. So uh, just somebody um, turn on your microphone and tell us your humble opinion or how do you do it? <clears throat> Sorry. Um... I can share how we do is basically the sending organization maybe can have a pre-selection process like selecting a kind of short list of volunteers of candidates they think they they could be right for the project because maybe some of them are from the local community maybe we personally know some of them maybe they already have a path with us maybe they already have a short term or some local or some training courses so this, this thing, but I think that the final selection should be on the host organization because it's the reality that better knows the person that better can benefit and can take benefit from the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Some other <coughs> procedures. I can uh, I can share how we did it uh, in the previous edition of Eurasia. So something similar. Yes, as we as a sending organization need a press selection and uh, had the interview only with those participants that we pre-selected and we proposed them um, to the hosting organizations. So basically they had a Skype interview with them and uh, finally decide, uh, we gave our recommendations as well, but finally it was up to them to decide uh, which person and which volunteer he will, uh, they will host. So that is how we did for each of the three countries uh, three years ago, two years ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, some more opinions or procedures from real life? 
maybe I can add something for this. So I agree with Rosica because we select participants, uh, but what we pro how we proceed is that we don't select, um, we don't propose the mission to different participants. We only propose to one participant and we see if it fits him or her. And then we propose the participant to the, to the hosting organization. Mm -hmm. But what I want to add is that, okay, the, the hosting organization is the one uh, agreeing on receiving or not the volunteer, but still, for example, if during the preparation phase, like we have a pre-departure training, we feel like the volunteer is not ready or, or if there's any problem, we can still change our mind and decide not to send the volunteer. So even if the hosting organization has agreed to receive them, uh, if we feel that it's not ready uh, or if there's any problem, we still can uh, decide to stop the sending of the volunteer. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. So from our experience, um, sometimes we feel we trust the sending organization so much that kind of we take anyone and the, the, the call was just kind of symbolic that this is the only proposed candidate and we, we trust you 100%. And it's connected with also what Daniela was speaking about, not choosing any of these experienced people that, uh, um, that if you know somebody from the local community, as Carolina mentioned, then and in person that, that we can really trust you in the decision, even though, you know, I mean, that, that would be a good relationship between the hosting sending to really understand, uh, really like trust and understand each other. And I would maybe like to ask Diapon or Om or Jennifer to tell us more because they are totally uh, to the left at DA. So what's their practice? Yes, actually, we are the representative from VSA Thailand. And from my experience of working uh, in this organization as a volunteer, I, I saw that TUM from VSA uh, always accept the volunteers from sending organization. And so far, there's no problem. So I think uh -huh. he's still okay and satisfied with this idea. And I think if sending organization choose the volunteer, it would save uh, time. No uh -huh. need to send uh, it back and forth. So it might be in from, from the sending organization and we could proceed to another step. That's my idea, thank you. Yes, I really like this point with saving time because of course, if the sending organization propose only one person and it's the best candidate, it's really good. Uh, yeah, so I understand. Okay, so let's go for another question. Very nice. So thank you very much. So let's continue with the question number two. It will appear. We see it already. So statement A, we need volunteers with skills. A statement B, motivation is enough. So which one would you choose? Yes, and feel free to comment again, like what was your experience in some past projects with skills versus motivation? I see most of you are in the middle, so you, you, you want the both of the things. <laughs> yeah, maybe I just want to comment that uh, also depends like how much time you can dedicate to the volunteer. So uh, yeah, you want to choose volunteer without uh, any previous experience, but uh, then you need to have a lot of time for them because they don't know anything basically. So uh, you need to teach them a lot. So it requires a lot of time. So maybe at least a little bit of skills if, if you don't have that much time, if it's like short term project, you know, they need to maybe learn in uh, like faster to, to do something. So uh -huh. it depends. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And some of these extreme positions. I've seen uh, that Niang is uh, totally close to the A, so maybe can you justify your statement? Very skilled. Already. You need to turn on the microphone, yeah. So uh, to me, I think um, in order to join a volunteer or to pick a volunteer, 
um, skill is uh, also important because um, volunteer is not all about uh, telling other to telling them to do something. It's like they know their ability, they have the ability to do, and then uh, they may need some guidance. And yeah, that's that's what I think. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I see the upon she's just total opposite of you, yeah, and uh, she's total for the motivation. Okay, so in uh, from my experience, I saw both both volunteers with skills and also with highly motivation. And for highly motivation, they they can accept uh, the new tasks that they are at SAI. So I think if they have passion enough, they, they can do it. Because uh, from BSA Thailand, I have seen that sometimes the task that we, we plan to give to, to the volunteer was changed. And, other, and the volunteers could accept and work. So I think it's not just the skills, it's the passion and motivation. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so let's go to the question number three. And this is especially case of uh, Southeast Asia hosting places because we speak a lot about this host family. And in Europe, I, from my experience, it's not so common. Nobody wants to live with a host family. <laughs> oh, somebody is there. <laughs> so I feel like, yeah, I might probably want to live with a hosting family, but then uh, I don't know really if there is an option to live uh, in a hosting family in Europe, for example. I think we are more um, for the living with other volunteers. So for example, as we in Mati Info, we have uh, one apartment and they're there all together. So yeah. Yes, so we, we never tried a host family. Uh, I, I tried a few times, but just for one week. Like uh, there is some experience in Slovakia that the volunteers live in a host family, but just the very first week and they, they move to some apartment where they have sometimes a single room and sometimes not even a single room because the accommodation can be quite expensive. So they are, uh, they are uh, like two volunteers of the same gender in one room, like bigger room with two beds and everything so this is quite common but uh, uh, we yeah. have a comment from uh, the upon she hosted five volunteers and it's great uh, as a house family you can also learn from volunteers she loves this experience so yeah definitely an example to lead mm -hmm. yeah, but they were um, I, yes please go ahead, go ahead. um for i think it depends because in in the bsa organization because we have like short-term volunteers and long-term if long term they decided to come for long term, they come he come alone and then so of course he have to choose like living with host family that, that can look after them like. Um, but if you are um, which is it form like a group international group you can live in with the others volunteers but also live in the host family, so. Mm -hmm. It depends on the design. You can design by yourself. Mm -hmm. So this sounds also a good combination. And actually, I also read a studies uh, done uh, like about the volunteering satisfaction and learning process. And it's true that uh, volunteers say that they learn mostly from other volunteers. So if they have chance to be with other volunteers who are in the same country and situation and even live together from different countries, this is one of the biggest learning points what the volunteers mentioned in the research. Okay, but I see most of you are more for- uh, May I add yes, something, please, please. Andre? Mm -hmm. uh, our organization has experience with both uh, practices because we had uh, also not only EVS volunteers, but also Peace Corps volunteers. And they prefer to live, uh, I mean, their program is uh, structured like that, that uh, they prefer to live uh, in a host family. So <laughs> have experience with both and uh, they mm, both have uh, pros and cons. Uh, 
Uh -huh. uh, they prefer that uh, in order to um, get uh, more close with the uh, culture, with uh, the community, to get more friends, etc. Uh -huh. uh, but from the other hand, uh, if they live alone or with the roommates, uh, they have more freedom to uh, go out, uh, to plan their time like they want, uh, etc. So. Um, and uh, in the same time, when they live in a host family, uh, the Peace Corps has uh, mm, extended uh, support for that kind of living. So that means a lot of uh, support for our organizations that are not uh, uh, into that kind of host uh, living with host family. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we have kind of a few minutes left, so just go to the yes. next question. So there are two questions left, so I would like to hear your opinions. This is a little bit related. The question is, what's the budget? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> exactly. Yes, so when we host in the capital in Bratislava, it's so difficult in compared to some small towns or even villages, you know, that's incomparable. Yeah, I would like to know, for example, in Italy, like because Italy is such a touristic attraction uh, uh, destination, like uh, how do you deal with accommodation and the prices of the accommodation, Vicolo Corto? Yeah, it's, it's a mess. It's, it's our problem, basically, because Italy is long and, as you know, its uh, prices are pretty different from the south to the north, uh, especially related to something like food or accommodations are the things that are really, really diverse from Sicily to Milan, for example. We are based in Pesaro, Pesaro is in the center, but it's more in the north, so our prices are similar to the north ones. And also in our, in our region, we are the northern province, we are close to Rimini, Bologna, all these places, so basically we have this influence and accommodations is pretty hard to find them because it's touristic, the place, so in the summer it's, it's kind of impossible, uh, we don't have much uh, donations from municipality and things like this. So that's why we are first to put volunteers in double bedrooms. Sometimes we even put them in three in triple bedrooms. Now we have we have the double bedrooms except for one reality that is directed from the Red Cross. So they have some national and internal funds to use on this. So yeah, of course I put myself in the middle because if it would be possible of course single room for the privacy and everything is great uh, sharing the accommodation so um, focusing on the intercultural learning and mix but having the privacy of the single bedroom but unfortunately here it's not possible so double bedrooms is is, mm -hmm. is also is also an option mm -hmm. and how is it in other countries Hello. <laughs> Rosita, can you maybe share with us? Unfortunately, to, to say that we didn't host a volunteer from abroad maybe three years or even more until from, sorry, from 2016, I believe. Uh, however, I believe they, uh, they were all accommodated in one apartment where they had uh, their single room. Mm -hmm. So basically they didn't uh, they didn't, uh, we didn't host them in the family. And in the a Asia, when they are in a host uh, family, they have usually a single room? Um, um, uh, okay. um, but for, um, for my personal experience uh, as a host, if like, if they come like, if we have a chance to, um, to separate them, if they come like just a few or volunteer one or two, so uh, we will ca we can like share the room um, as a single room. We have shared some parts of the house we to them for a single room. But if we cannot, we we um talk discuss talk together. Like can we share a room because we don't have like um, more spaces for for all of the volunteers. Then it's okay for them because 
the accumulation sometimes is not enough to the group. So mm -hmm. we can talk. I see. I see. I see. So okay. if there are, yes, if there are no more comments, the very last question from me for you. Okay, so the last question, statement A, food is provided by the host family, B, food money is given to the volunteer directly. So which one do you choose? How are you doing with your organization? Okay, I see most of us are already giving the food money to the volunteer. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this was simple and also it was interesting to read in the um, guide, uh, the info pack from uh, Vietnam, that there is just this option, but you need to tell the host family in uh, advance. So this was interesting procedure. So there is this opportunity to cook or have something together, but you need to agree about it uh, before. So this was uh, also interesting. Yes, so this will be anyway uh, written in the volunteering agreement uh, because it's uh, related with the money. So, okay, we are on the same page. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your active participation. Mishka.